So good morning and so good to see everyone here for our service together. It's a privilege uh, to lead us in God's word. I invite you into the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians. And as you're turning there, obviously we all had very momentous day yesterday uh, for me personally. Whenever I make pumpkin soup, it's quite a project. So finally I was able to finish that and I, I'm, I think it was tasty, but uh, uh, I think there was a few other things happening yesterday, notably the provincial election, and we want to keep praying uh, about uh, our, um, our political situation, pray for our leaders, as God has invited us to do, pray that we'll have the kind of society where the gospel can go forward. Uh, thinking of a society, I want you to try and imagine living in a kingdom. Now, sometimes uh, we have movies that will, you know, transport us back to another time where there was a king and a queen, and we have that kind of environment in which to live. Uh, as of this year, there are 43 sovereign states in the world uh, with a monarch as head of state, not always um, the acting head of state, more as a figurehead often. 13 are in Asia, 12 are in Europe, 9 in the Americas, 6 in Oceania, and there are 3 uh, monarchies in uh, Africa. Um, as Canadians, of course, we're most familiar with the United Kingdom, and what I think uh, we need to think about is what, what is significant about life in a kingdom? And as I thought about that, I thought that the important thing is that we are in right relationship with the king, uh, that we're under uh, the right authority of a sovereign, or as we often say in Canada, of course, you know, that we're in right relationship with the crown, right, with the, the, those in leadership. And today I want us to think about what it means to live in God's kingdom. And this is the second theme in our series, My Chains are gone and in this scripture survey what we're attempting to do is to examine 10 different word pictures of God's amazing grace. So last week um, I introduced this chart to you that kind of tracks these. Last week um, we thought about what it means to use uh, a loop, uh, a little magnifier to kind of zero in on some of the precise details of these different metaphors. Last week we talked about being an enemy that is reconciled, and then today it's similar, um, but you know, just to, to re remark again, this being changed from enemy now to having a new relationship with God. Paul is emphasizing the joy, the liberation, the freedom, the excitement that that relationship brings. And similarly today, as we, we think about what it means to move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God. That is our theme, and we find it in Colossians chapter 1. And I wish we could really study the whole chapter. I'll, I'll be, by the time we're done, you might say, oh, it sounds like he gave us the whole chapter anyways. But we're going to try and narrow down into verses 9 through 14 and we're going to go eventually you'll see I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go backwards uh, uh, through the passage but let me read um, these verses for us uh, Colossians chapter 1 I'm beginning I'm going the right direction when I read and then when we talk about it we'll go the reverse uh, verse 9 for this reason, is thinking back upon, reflecting on what he's just said to the Colossians about their uh, coming to faith in Christ. He said, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. 
for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> One of the uh, things that we find about the Colossian church was that it wasn't founded by Paul. It was actually pioneered by Epaphras. We learn that in chapter 1 and verse 7. But Paul was kind of pastoring the Colossians at a distance. He was very passionate. Uh, you know, when you read words like, we constantly pray for you, we pray for you with thanksgiving, it sounds like he's, part, he's right there, part of their congregation. But he was caring for them at a distance. The balance of uh, Colossians chapter 1 celebrates Jesus' work of creation and recreation. And I, I love what one author says, you know, Colossians is about a head for the body, whereas Ephesians, which is closely related in content, is about the body for the head. Uh, so, you know, you take Colossians and Ephesians together, you get a real sense of how Jesus is the head over the church and how we as the church are under and we are serving uh, Jesus as the head of the church. Um, the letter uh, to the Colossians had a real Christological confusion. There was, there was teaching present that Jesus, that Christ, this Christological notion, it was really in confusion because some were saying that Jesus isn't enough for us. And so there have to be other things, uh, other spiritual things we have to do in order to be saved. And so this was something that Paul was addressing, and that's why we read as we do. If we kept reading in chapter 1, his, his um, explanation of who Jesus gets loftier and loftier. It's, it's just an amazing passage. Um, another author says, a Colossian, Colossians presents great truth about the belief that believers are complete in Christ to produce a great effect of moral transformation. So we don't want to just st stand back and say, wow, Jesus is amazing. That's incredible. Where are we going for lunch? Right? We want to say, uh, wow, that's incredible. What difference does that make in my life? How should my life be transformed? Now, one of the key issues addressed in Colossians is the tension between anthropocentric and Christocentric soteriology. Isn't that a great sentence? Uh, say it fast five times, right? The, the simple way of saying it is, you know, is my salvation based on what I do and what I say and how I have acted in relation to God? Or is it based on how God has acted on my behalf? And I think as we go, I think as we go through this passage, it will be really clear, uh, crystal clear in my opinion, um, uh, the answer to that question. You know, it's not like seminary when I remember um, someone asked a question and the seminary professor says, that's a good question. We should all ask good questions. You know, it's good to ask good questions and search out. Okay, next question, right? Almost sounds like a politician. Um, but I think our passage is very clear. And if you're not, if you're, if you're not sure where I'm headed, it's, it's the top one. Uh, it's really about what God has done. That's, and that's actually my first point. Uh, this passage, really from verse 9 all the way to verse 20, is kind of like one huge expression of thought. Paul uh, was, in the way he wrote, he would write these long sentences that had so many different clauses, and, and they would, uh, they, he would pack in so much in this sort of uh, dense um, sentence, if you will. And so what I've done is we're just looking at verse 9 to 14, and I'm going to begin in the last two verses at the end here. And I want to look at what God has done. And then we'll, we'll back up to the first uh, few verses and think about what he will do as it relates to saving us. What has God done? Um, growing up as I did, very close to the ocean, 
you know, I always uh, thought about that we were always at the ocean, always thought about the ocean. And so when I hear the idea of a rescue mission, and when I hear about God's rescue, I tend to think about this kind of a scene. Uh, you know, water rescue, someone completely helpless. Um, the, the, there's no way they can rescue themselves. And there are really some twin truths here uh, pictured by two kingdoms. And I, so I brought some binoculars today. Last week we had one uh, magnifying device, and these are binoculars. You know, I have a terrible problem because uh, when I'm uh, trying to use binoculars, I can't use my glasses, so I take my glasses off. Then the balance of my eyes is gone, so I got to close one. But ideally, um, it's best to see the image through both lenses, right? That's the ideal in uh, a, a pair of binoculars. And I, I think the same is true here. We've got to have a clarity about our lostness as much as our foundness. We've got to have uh, clarity about the reality of our enslavement to sin and being in one kingdom, but also to understand how we've been transferred to a new kingdom. And this is what Paul is getting across in verses 13 and 14. He begins by talking about the way in which we have been delivered and transferred. Now, Paul, in Paul's presentation, He's stressing deliverance, deliverance from one kingdom and then entrance into another kingdom. And there's no middle ground. I love the way uh, Herbert Carson puts this. He says, from rebel kingdom to rightful king. I, I think that's a good way. It's not just that we're into a new kingdom, but we're now in relationship, intimate relationship with the king of that kingdom. And so from rebel king, kingdom to rightful king. And as I thought about this, the, the, the first thought was, and if you can imagine, you're watching a Cold War era movie, right? And if you think about transferring, you know, the spy is getting transferred, what's the image? I don't know why, it seems always the same. It's always a bridge, it's dark, there are headlights on one side of the bridge and there are headlights on the other side of the bridge. And this uh, um, official is standing on this side and on the other side, the other official, and then the spy is gonna be transferred. And there's, there's no middle ground, right? You're either on one side or the other side. There are these two kingdoms. There's no middle ground. And so the first part of the equation is that we have to be rescued from the dominion. The idea here is it's, the word literally is authority. And, and one translator said, perhaps we could read it, we need to be delivered from the tyranny of darkness. And that's a good way, I think, of expressing the experience that we have when we are apart from Christ, when we're in the dominion of darkness. I don't need to explain to you when I say darkness and light. These are images that are quickly, we're very, uh, it's a very intuitive thing to discover and, and see how it points to lostness and helplessness, so deliverance from tyranny. But I think it's important to say, this is not just liberation from personal failure or regret. If that were the case, if it's just helping us to be better, you know, uh, and, and there are messages out there, come on, you know, um, buy my product and you'll be better, right? And this is not deliverance that we're talking about here. That would just be self-improvement. And I'm thinking, if I'm lost and utterly helpless to redeem myself, even if I better myself a, a, a bunch, it's not good enough, right? I'm still lost. You know, if I could, if I was lost at sea, and I, you know, um, Lana, Lana swims back and forth across the channel there uh, when we go to uh, Barnett Marine Park. I swim about 10 or 20 yards. I, I'm a much more efficient swimmer. I can get about the same amount of exercise in 10, 20, 30 yards as she does in, in hundreds of yards. Let's say I could be better. Let's say I could swim hundreds of yards. Let's say I could swim 500 yards or, or half a kilometer. That's about the same, isn't it, roughly? Uh, maybe I could swim a kilometer. But if I'm 10, 20, 30 kilometers out at sea, lost, it doesn't matter. I'm, I, I, I can't just rely on being better. 
And so we're rescued. And it's not just liberation from personal failure. We're rescued. And then I think the other word is interesting. We're transported or transferred. Uh, you could even translate it deported. We're, we're deported uh, wonderfully out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the, of the sun. Now, what's interesting is the way it's described. This kingdom is described in verse uh, 13 as uh, in the kingdom of the sun. Do you notice what it says there? He loves or we could write it in the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, this is not the only time this word is used in the, the, the letter. Uh, it's, it's also used in verse 1 of the same chapter of Epaphras. In chapter 4, verse 7 of Tychicus. In um, chapter 4, verse 9 of Onesimus. And then of Luke in verse 14 of the fourth chapter. And most notably, Paul describes, in, this is in chapter 3 and verse 12, he refers to all believers in Jesus as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, loved. We have a friend in Greece, uh, used to be, uh, he's a senior now, used to be Lana's um, youth director, and he's written me, he writes in English, but you can tell he's thinking in Greek because he writes, Dear Beloved in the Lord Brent. And that, that, that's kind of how Paul is writing here. And when you think of we're in the kingdom of darkness, we're lost and helpless, we're delivered from that, and we're transferred, and now we are the beloved in the Lord ones. We're the ones that God loves. We're God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So delivered and transferred. And then Paul says in verse 14, we're redeemed and forgiven. Um, Paul is explaining further the work of Jesus. Uh, I think, first of all, we've got, you know, the term redemption because that helps us understand that there needed to be a payment price. Why? Because we were held captive. And what you pay when there's a captive, you pay a ransom. The ransom is paid. This is the idea of the word redemption. And it's quite appropriate when you think of someone captive to darkness. A ransom is paid, they are redeemed. But further, they are forgiven. And this term has the idea of canceling out the sin debt. And if we were to look for an illustration, we could talk about the, you know, your mortgage and someone says, ah, let me pay that off for you. Um, we unfortunately don't live in that kind of a world. But um, in the Old Testament, we have a beautiful picture. It's the year, do you remember the year of Jubilee? That uh, in a cycle of seven years, and it was all about release from obligation, release from indebtedness, release and this is the truth that Paul is expressing here. We are released that weight of guilt and sin uh, that is upon a person who is captive to the kingdom of darkness. They are not only uh, uh, redeemed, but they are released. And this is a wonderful um, experience. In Psalm 103, if you want to turn there, uh, to, to read also, you're welcome, One, Psalm 103. And, you know, um, we try to have the main scriptures on the screen, but I really encourage you, uh, whether you're using your device or a paper copy of the scripture, have it with you, you know, make some notes. Um, it, it, it just helps some of these things stick uh, f for further reflection and further, further uh, help. Um, Psalm 103 in verse 8, um, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What a beautiful expression. In fact, I was talking with a colleague this week, and he said that he had been on a trip one time with Christians in another part of the world, and they actually had a practice. They would, as a congregation, they would turn and face 
the east, and, and then they would turn and face the west as they, they recited this promise of God, right? And uh, we, it would, this is very nice and handy for us because we know which direction is east and west here very clearly. So having looked at what God has done, now, now let's back up uh, to verse 9 through 12 and l- let's see what he will do because the project has only begun, right? We've only just started into this journey if we've been uh, rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred. Now God has some things he's going to do and, and this is what Paul is praying for because as he has said in verse 9, he's, you know, reflecting uh, in, in his prayer, he's reflecting his longing for these people, these new believers, based on their testimony of uh, having come to Christ. And he's got four things. I think there's a number of ways of breaking this down because Paul's language is quite um quite complex here. There's a lot of detail, intricate detail, in the sense that there are some main things he's saying, but then there's things that support that or expand on that. But I've chosen uh, to break it down this way. I think there's kind of four main things Paul is asking on behalf of these folks. And first, it has to do with God filling them, filling Uh, Have you ever been at a restaurant and you're wondering, I don't know if this, uh, have you ever applied this, uh, this idea? I I figured out a way to tell if your waitress is uh, married or not, Uh, because uh, we used to have our little kids with us when the kids were little and you, and you say, could we get some water for the kids or some juice? And if, if the waitress came and she had that water cup for the little ones, you know, completely filled to the very top. That's, oh, well, she doesn't have kids at home. But if she had kids at home, you, she would bring it, you know, uh, allowing room for spillage, right? Or bumping or knocking it over. And here we are with this idea. It's not really complex. It's this idea of filling, that we'd be filled up to a, a fullness. And when we fill a glass to the rim, we'd say it's, it's complete, right? It's at capacity, And this is the sense in which uh, Paul is writing, that we would be at our full completeness or we would experience totality in Christ. Remember the heresy in Colossians that I mentioned? And some writers are saying perhaps it wasn't so well articulated that it was identified as a formal heresy, but it was still a destructive notion. And this is how it went. Christ is insufficient, and thus we're not complete in him. And, and so we have that as the, the background to Paul saying in chapter 2 and verse 9, Christ is the full, complete expression of who the Father is, and we are complete in him. When I was a little kid at Bible camp, We had a song. I didn't realize later, until much later, when I was in college, how profound that song was. We used to sing, um, complete, complete, complete in him. We are complete in him. And, you know, as little kids, we were just belting it out because uh, we were looking forward to snack after chapel, right? But um, what a wonderful thing we were learning already as, as little kids. God was well pleased pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. That's also in verse 19 of chapter 1. And then, of course, as I mentioned in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, um, not only is the fullness of who God is embodied in Christ, but then we experience fullness in Christ. And so this is an idea of totality or completion, not perfection of performance, but a sense of completeness to our soul, we might say wholeness. Or we might even, maybe more practically, we have a sense of purpose in our lives. And it's because of our union with Jesus Christ. What's the object of that? Uh, Here are some of the extra particular details. Full knowledge, not just a little bit of knowledge, not just casual acquaintance, but the word is full knowledge in contrast to human philosophy or human reason, and then that we would have wisdom and the knowledge or insight uh, 
such that it's spiritual. It's God's wisdom at work in our lives. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Not trusting in our own wisdom, but in all of our ways, acknowledging and letting God uh, lead us. So filling is the first thing for which Paul is praying. Growing is another thing that's in verse 10. Growing implies, one author says, a fitness that matches the fullness. If you have that fullness, if you have that sense of completeness in Christ, a sense of purpose, then there's going to be a certain way of living. And the term walk is not just used as uh, the physical act of walking, but as the way we live our lives. Uh, the RSV translates it this way, to lead a life worthy of the Lord, or to walk worthy, to live out our lives in a worthy way. And Colossians, just to back, I go back again to chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, there's a paradox there. I love it. It's, it and, and Miss Stevens, my grade 9, grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12 English teacher, you thought she was, uh, she was signing up, you know, just to teach English. But can you imagine having me in your English class four years straight? Poor Miss Stevens. Um, she, she, I'm sure she had a, a note. I'm pretty sure she had her teaching notes. And then along the column it said, every so often, would someone please wake Brent up? Because um, I, I did kind of snooze a little bit in English class. But here, she might struggle as we might struggle. So what is it? Are we supposed to walk and progress? Or are we to be rooted? Or are we to be established? The answer is yes, right? We are to move forward. We are to be rooted. It's, it's a paradox. But it's a wonderful paradox that is possible in our relationship with Jesus. Walking in a worthy way implies ongoing action. It means being pleasing, Paul says, in the way we serve. It means bearing fruit. It means growing, growing in a complete knowledge of God. Same word as in verse 9. And let's just be honest. Rarely is growth explosive and speedy like a sprint, right? Is life like 100 meters? I sure hope not, because I don't know if you realize, I'm not much of a runner and never have been. Um, when I got into high school, I finally discovered I could still get participation points for the year of end track meet if my buddy and I got some sound equipment and we an announced the races. So that's what we did. That's, that's how I participated in track. But, but life is not a sprint. It's a long distance marathon, right? And I, and I love what the Persians say. They have this saying, drop by drop, the ocean is made. Isn't that good? Drop by drop, the ocean is made. We might say, step by step, we grow in the Lord. We, we progress, but it has to be progressing. It needs to be intentional. And the gospel was that source of that growth. If you go back to Colossians 1, just go back to verse 6. What does Paul say about the gospel message? Or we could say the truth of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. Verse 6, uh, this gospel that has come to you all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to bear fruit and grow. What, what's the source the gospel. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Look, if this is true, then that tells us that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing in, I don't know, some place like Colombia, right? Is that possible? Or, or Af Afghanistan. Is the gospel bearing fruit and growing in Afghanistan or Iran? Actually, studies are telling us in Iran, amazingly, the church is growing in wonderful ways. So if this is true, if the gospel is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, then the gospel can bear fruit and grow in you and in me, right? That's a reality that Paul points them to. So filling is one request, growing, and then being strengthened, or just to put it in the same form, strengthening. God is in the business of strengthening us, empowering us is this idea. And I, I think there's both a means 
and, and a measure. The means is, and, the, and this is pretty cool, um, Paul doesn't say, God will help you out on occasion, or if you get stuck, um, you know, like right now I'm struggling. There's a paper on my desk from, from the BCAA. I haven't had to call on them to help me out of a jam, but they want me to sign up for another year, and I'm thinking, sure, if I don't sign up this year, this will be the year I'll need to call on them for uh, pulling me out of the ditch, right? But this is not what we're talking about. Oh, if I have a little problem, God will kind of help me out of a pinch. No, this is all power. All power according to what? His glorious might. We're not talking about just a little bit of energy of God, which would be more than enough for us, right? We're talking about the glorious might of God, all of his power. So this is what is available to us. And then there's some measurement. Uh, patience, long-suffering, and joy. And uh, if, you, if, if I was to put that piece of paper, like a checklist, am I patient? Am I long-suffering? We might use the word resilient there. Um, joyful, if I put that checklist on my desk, boy, I don't know. That's a tough one, isn't it? Uh, but this is the measure of how God wants to not just provide power, but for a purpose of changing our character in the midst of our lives. Not when things get better or when things are easy, but in each and every moment of our lives. It's exciting to think that whether I'm in a pickle or whether I'm on a mountaintop, in my life, whatever season I might be in, it's all of God's power and it's his glorious might that's available to help me. Now, Paul's last request ties in very nicely with this season we're in and it is the, the, um, the command or the um, privilege really of thanking, being thankful. And it's important to note that the joy that we're to have as we grow is, is also conditioning our thankfulness. Uh, I was driving here this morning and I was thinking, can you be thankful without joy? And so what came to my mind was, and you've been there, be honest, I won't get you to raise your hand, but I think we've all been there. Christmas morning, you're all excited. You grab the package, it's beautifully wrapped. And you're, you know, you're just, oh, what's in here? And you're just excited and you're opening it and then there's a sweater from grandma and you say, oh, grandma, thank you, right? Come on, we've all been there, right? Now, the, question, the philosophical question I was asking myself this morning was, is it even real thankfulness if joy is absent, right? Is it? Can there be such a thing as joyless thanksgiving? Because I've often given thanks perfunctorily, right? That's not joyful thanks. That's, oh, Grandma, th thank you so much, right, for these itchy wool socks. They're lovely, right? You remember, you remember some of the wool things we wore? Do you remember, uh, like, uh, if you're from Columbia, you might not have this childhood memory, but some of us have the memory, especially if we lived on the West Coast, and if finally our prayers were answered and we got snow and we went out with our woolen mittens and by the, by the time you had thrown like three and a half snowballs, your mittens were, were twice as long and they were heavy and wet and they were hanging off and you might as well go and bear. Oh, oh, what we experienced when we were young. So thankfulness has to, like, it's just doesn't make sense for it not to be infused or conditioned by joy. And this joy-filled gratitude is, for Paul, you know, pretty basic. It starts off basic. If you, if you were to turn back to chapter 1, uh, in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love you have uh, for all the saints. So it starts off at the level of we're just so thankful. You know Jesus and you care for one another. But he gets a lot more particular here 
in verse 12 because now he's talking about what God has done. <coughs> Excuse me. And how God has qualified us or this word means that it's like he's authorized us. He's particularly um, made us qualified or authorized to be in his kingdom. So much so that we are what Paul describes as saints in light, which is quite appropriate, right? Before we were sinners in darkness, now we're saints in light. And so much uh, we have been we have been qualified or made fit or authorized to the point now we are linked and united with others in his kingdom and we are heirs to the kingdom. Right. We are those who can receive all of the blessings and the riches of the king. Paul is praying that they will be filled, grow they will be strengthened. They will be thankful. And so we must watch out. And I just to encourage you to go to digging deeper um, just as we wrap up here. And I, I'm going to, I have one song on there. Uh, maybe don't log in too quick when you get home because I'm going to add one more song. It's the one, one of the ones we sang today just for a further reflection on what it means that Christ is living in us. Uh, so go to Digging Deeper if you want to reflect. All my notes are there in some of these links. But we really need to watch out for the...